so much uh, for waiting. Uh, my name is Jessica. I'm really excited to be here in Israel for the first time to talk about something uh, that is really important to me, and I'm excited to be able to share it with you all. This is a talk about representation. Uh, so last Sunday, I was in San Quentin State Prison in California. That's what it looks like. Uh, San Quentin is the oldest prison in California. It is currently significantly over capacity. Uh, it houses over 3,700 inmates uh, who've been sentenced to life in prison or to the death penalty. Uh, 800 of those men are on death row uh, in San Quentin, making San Quentin the largest death row in the Western Hemisphere. Uh, and I was in San Quentin to visit with a dozen inmates from the Society for Professional Journalists uh, and from a program called The Last Mile. San Quentin is the first prison ever to house journalist inmates recognized by this society. Um, they write for the San Quentin newspaper, which is distributed to prisons up and down the west coast of, of California, um, as well as for external media outlets. So there were folks, uh, inmates from the Society of Professional Journalists, uh, and there were also uh, folks from The Last Mile, the Last Mile is a program to prepare incarcerated individuals for successful re-entry through business and technology training. And the Last Mile has a sub-program called Code 7370. It was started in 2014, and it's the first ever computer programming curriculum in a United States prison. Uh, in Code 7370, uh, the students learn HTML and JavaScript and CSS, and they learn Python. Internet access is not allowed uh, in the prison, so everything is done through thumb drives and PDFs. And a big part of these programs is bringing in people from outside to mentor and to speak about the industry. So that's how I ended up in San Quentin last Sunday, sitting in a circle made of chairs and leading a discussion about technology. This visit was uh, sort of structured to be an open-ended conversation between the inmates in these programs and me as someone with a background in technology and entrepreneurship uh, who is also deeply interested in the use of technology in the criminal justice system in the United States. It was supposed to be a three-hour conversation, but we ended up running uh, way over time, and it was really nice of, of the, the folks running the prison to let us run over uh, because it was such a rich discussion. We, we really talked about, about everything. Um, we talked about access to technology, to the demographics of software engineering, to the use of, of algorithms and artificial intelligence in uh, things that affect these folks' lives, like predictive policing and bail and sentencing and parole decisions, all of which are happening today in the United States. Uh, towards the end of this conversation, one of the participants asked me a question. Uh, he said, Jessica, so why are you here? <laughs> like, how did you come to be here? Like, wh why do you care about this stuff? Uh, because the reality is that most people don't care. Like, most people don't think about what's happening to the two million people in prison or jail in the U.S. So how did you come to care so deeply about technology and diversity and the criminal justice system uh, that you would come to a prison on a Sunday to talk about it with a bunch of life sentence inmates? And I answered that question in the room, but I want to answer it again here with you uh, today. Because as it turns out, the Python community is actually a really big part of the answer. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. So, I'm me. I've been around for a little while. I was, I'm a former director of the Python Software Foundation. I've been PyCon North America's diversity chair for a while. Uh, back when I lived in Boston, I was an organizer for the Boston Python user group. Um, while I was there, that grew to become the largest Python user group in the world, due in large part to a number of very concerted diversity outreach initiatives. I've also used Python uh, for all of the jobs that I've ever had. So this is a community and language that's very important to me because this is really all I know how to do. So I, I need Python to continue being successful. Uh, most recently, I was at Dropbox. I was an engineering director. Dropbox uh, is one of the largest Python distributions in the world, shipping this Python desktop client to uh, hundreds of millions uh, of, of desktops. Uh, and now I'm the CTO of an enterprise software startup that is using Python 3, and it's quite lovely. 
Uh, and so that's what we're going to talk about today. We're going to talk about these inmates and why being in this room with you all is a big part of that conversation. This is really a conversation about representation. So in answering the question, uh, why am I passionate about technology diversity in the criminal justice system, uh, I want to talk about four very interrelated topics. And those are accessibility, access, diversity, and representation. And your experience may be totally different from mine, but the Python community is actually how I first engaged deeply with all four of these topics. Um, and that's why I want to talk about it with you. Because this community has significantly shaped who I am, and in a very concrete way has turned me into an activist. And I think that's a good thing, and I want more people to have that experience, and I want to pay that forward. And be before I get to it, I do want to highlight that the, f the fact that the Python community is how I first engaged deeply with these topics says a lot about the, the privilege that I have. Uh, it's also a reminder that one of the really powerful things about communities is that they expose you to far more backgrounds and conditions than any one person could have, and that's something to celebrate and to learn from. But okay, we're going to talk about these four things. We're going to start with accessibility. So let me share some things that I've learned about accessibility from the Python community in the context of the physical and the digital spaces that we share, as well as the software that we build together. So PyCon 2012 was my first ever PyCon in person. Um, and while I was there, I presented a poster. And I happened to be presenting this poster next to Katie Cunningham. Katie Cunningham has written books and given a lot of talks. And she knows a lot about accessibility. And that day, uh, she was presenting a poster on accessibility right next to me. And this is not a topic that I had engaged with deeply beforehand. Uh, I definitely didn't learn about it in school. It hadn't come up at work. There's this thing called 508 compliance, which I had never heard of. This is a set of accessibility standards to which all federal agencies in the US government must comply. And I remember just sort of listening, overhearing the conversations that were happening in front of her poster. And I remember going home and reading the Wikipedia page on section 508 that night. And I remember thinking, I want to understand more about what the people she's talking about experience. So I, I, I pulled up a screen reader for the first time to navigate the, the old python.org homepage as an experiment because I was curious what it felt like to navigate if you were blind using a screen reader. And you know what it felt like? It felt totally overwhelming. Um, it seemed impossible to learn how to program uh, using that tool, at least in my naive hands. And it's, of course, not impossible. People do it all the time. But I felt very viscerally in that moment that it must really suck when people make software and websites with poor accessibility if you actually rely on that stuff. And now that I knew about this, because I didn't, I didn't really understand before, now that I knew about this, I wanted to make sure that I was doing a good job in the software that I was building at work and in the open source projects to which I contributed. And that's a moment that has stuck with me to today. Like once I knew about this, I cared. And this is stuff that really matters to a lot of people. This is how they interact with the world and it needs to work for them. As another example of accessibility in action, something that I really appreciate uh, having the chance to experience while organizing Boston Python user group events and as being on staff for PyCon is watching a group of volunteers figure out how to be as inclusive as possible on a budget. We saw the, the opening ceremony uh, video, Budgets Are Real, um, and I really like the way that PyCon UK handles this. Um, they have an entire page dedicated to diversity, accessibility, and inclusion. And when I read this, I, I really feel like they care about me and the community. And I love that conferences can read these things from each other, and they can share and remix this content so it's always getting better. Now, conferences and user groups have different levels of resourcing. Not every event can provide everything to everyone. But documents like this raise awareness, uh, and they start a conversation. 
And they tell attendees that you care and that you're trying. And I think that that's really important. And I'm really happy to see that these things are mostly taken as commonplace these days, because that wasn't true 10 years ago. We didn't see this. One of the many great things about the Python community is that it's adjacent to and overlapping with expertise in a bunch of other communities. So when I meet people in a Python context, following their story often enriches me in unexpected ways. Like, I remember this tweet going around, and I saw this tweet, and it made me think. Like, I, I sat there and I read this, and I thought about it for a couple of minutes. Uh, and I saw it because someone I follow in the Python community retweeted it. And it's like accessibility really coming home through the network that we're creating with each other. I wanted to share a short clip from an old PyCon talk that I think is a really beautiful synthesis, an example of accessibility in action in this community. And I'm gonna play it and I'm gonna hope, we didn't get to test if the sound works, so I'm gonna hope that this does what I want. Maybe, what if I do it this way? Oh no. but I do so want you to work. Okay. Well, um, oh. And the sound is probably not gonna work, but the good thing about this is that it's subtitled, which is part of why we're talking about it. So this is a talk that was given by someone who's a professional stenographer, and a stenographer is someone who transcribes things live with very high accuracy using some specialized tooling. And this is really important uh, for a lot of reasons, but it's very important from an accessibility perspective. This is a discipline that enables stuff to be live translated, making it accessible to people who can't otherwise follow along. And this is a talk about someone who is frustrated with the existing proprietary software and hardware, and they decided to make their own version that was much cheaper and open source using Python. And sharing it back out, like you know, sort of publishing the, the plans for this uh, you know, under a permissive license so that other people could use it as well. And what I love that's so full circle about this is this person saw a problem a problem related to accessibility, decided they wanted to fix it, used Python to fix it, gave a talk at a Python conference about it, and the videos are published with subtitling on PyVideo because this is something that we've decided that we care about as a community, and so we make a point of uh, doing this subtitling live so that people at the conference can, can enjoy the talks with everyone else. And I think that's just a really beautiful sort of full cycle example of what this language and this community make possible, uh, and how the sharing happens. So I thought that was really nice. And I'm sorry the sound didn't work, but at least the subtitling works. And we keep trying to be better every year. And people notice, because it matters. So once you become aware of accessibility as a concept, once you see people impacted by it, you often can't help but become an activist of sorts. You now care. And you don't just care inside the Python community, you end up caring everywhere. So I now pay attention to accessibility everywhere. I pay attention in the environments where I work. I pay attention when I travel. There's a lot going on in the US right now. I pay attention where I protest. Uh, and I try to follow and amplify the voices of people who are directly affected by these topics. And I really owe the Python community for the opportunity to, to really have to engage with this stuff as a community organizer. So accessibility, it's important. And I really first engaged with this at PyCon 2012. So thanks, Katie Cunningham. So that was accessibility. And accessibility really goes hand in hand with access more broadly, because if you can't use it, it really doesn't matter that it's there for you to technically use. So let's talk about access. And I want to show you some slides from a keynote that I gave at PyCon North America in 2014. This was a talk about the state of computer science education in the United States. Uh, I went to high school in Tennessee, a public high school in Tennessee. This is the state depicted in these slides, home of Jack Daniels and a lot of really good country music and a lot of other things. Um, 
And I was fortunate to be in a school that offered sort of the most common programming opportunity at high schools in the United States, which is AP Computer Science. So the AP, AP Computer Science is the main computer science exam and class offered in the United States. There are around 285,000 high school students in Tennessee. And barely 250 of those 285,000 students took that computer science exam that year. That's like 0.09% of the students. Uh, and the issue here is not a lack of interest. If you frame programming correctly, programming is really cool and really powerful and kids want to learn it. The problem here was a lack of access. So when I wrote this talk, which was just a couple of years ago, fewer than one in 10 students in public schools in the United States were in a school that offered programming classes. In fact, my sister, who is here with me today and also went to a school in Tennessee, could not take a programming class because none were offered in her school. And the scary thing about access is that a lack of access often compounds diversity issues. So for example, there were nearly a dozen states that year in which zero, zero African American students took the computer science exam. There were states where not a single girl took the exam. Imagine you live in that state there, and you could be the only one. And you hope that you pass, because you're going to feel like, you know, all girls everywhere's ability to prove that they can program is riding on you if you're literally the only one doing it, right? That's a lot of pressure. Not a single girl took an exam in these three states. And in fact, computer science is the most gender skewed AP exam by far. So you can see it uh, in the bottom of this graph in red. This is showing a log scale of the ratio of female to male test takers. And you see it goes way off to the left. And when I wrote this talk originally, um, I wanted to talk about this because the Python community is very affected by this. And, and really an entire industry is affected by this. Um, an incredible amount of outreach has happened in the Python community to compensate for this access issue. And the outreach is beautiful, but it, it is compensating for something. Like, this is not the root cause. Um, so to reach kids, for example, we do outreach like this. This is a Raspberry Pi workshop that happened in North Carolina. Or this. Uh-oh. Uh, this is a photo from a young coders class at Pi, Tennessee in 2014. This is actually a picture of my sister. Hi, Olivia. Uh, who is here today. And uh, remember, she, she couldn't learn how to program in school. So the way that she was first exposed to Python is through a young coders program set up at a regional Python conference because people cared enough that they wanted to make sure kids had access. And it's not just kids. Right? So Python communities around the world have set up programming workshops to reach adults who maybe didn't have access as kids or got into programming later in life. And we've also worked hard to reach people for whom access is practically speaking, coupled to being in an environment that feels safe and welcoming and supportive of people like them. I see you, Django girls. I see you. Yeah. We've also worked hard to support people for whom access requires assistance. And as with accessibility, conferences and user groups have vastly different levels of resourcing. Not every event can provide everything to everyone. But again, when we document this stuff, it raises awareness and it starts a conversation and that conversation is really important. And this tells attendees that you care and that you're trying. And when I read this stuff, like, I, I really think about it. Like, I, don't, I don't have kids. I would like to someday. Um, but I don't think I in isolation could come up with such a comprehensive set of policies to really try to make a conference available to everyone. So I and we all really benefit from the diverse collective experience and wisdom of the community working together to provide access. And like with accessibility, once you become aware of access as a concept, like once this is a term you can use, once you see people impacted by the lack of access, you often cannot help but become an activist because you now care. And you don't just care inside the Python community, you care everywhere. And I think about the inmates in San Quentin, who I was visiting, who want to learn how to program, 
so they can get jobs. Getting a job after you've uh, been in prison for 20 years is not easy. And I think about what access they had or more likely didn't have before they were in prison and how that might have changed things. And I think about the very thin internetless version of access that they have today. I spend a lot of time thinking about that. We spend a lot of time in the Python community thinking about not just who has access, but also who feels included and who actually participates and what the resulting composition of our community is. So I've spent a lot, I've spent a lot of time on this personally uh, as the diversity chair for PyCon North America for several years and in, in various other venues. Um, and through a lot of outreach effort distributed across many people, uh, we've retrieved results uh, primarily focused on women speakership that we are very proud of. Um, these results persisted through the switch to a blind application review process. These are results that have really motivated many other open source communities to strive for results like this. Oh, thank you. And the, the funny thing about this, because I, I get a lot of questions about how this is possible, and, and what's funny is that there's absolutely no magic here. Uh, what makes this work is, number one, have a conference with a reputation for content that will interest folks of diverse backgrounds. Number two, make the conference accessible, including initiatives like financial aid and child care. And then number three, and this is the vast majority of it, you literally just write hundreds of emails. Hundreds. I wrote 600 emails uh, for PyCon 2017. You write hundreds of emails to people individually, lever leveraging institutions like PyLadies and local user groups to source potential speakers. And if you do that outreach, and it takes a ton of time, but if you do the work, it's like a funnel. And what you put in the top of the funnel will predictably fall out at the bottom. And that's what it takes to get these results. So hundreds of hours of emailing hundreds of people, but it works. And now that we have a repeatable, sustainable process in place for attracting women as speakers for PyCon North America, uh, we're very excited to broaden our outreach to other historically underrepresented groups, and we should and we need to, and that's what we're gonna do next year. The inmates at San Quentin were very interested in the topic of diversity. We spent a lot of time talking about this. This story started, so this started with a story that we were using uh, to introduce and ground for the group the concept of algorithms and artificial intelligence. You may be familiar with this story. It was in the news quite a bit. Uh, in 2015, Google got in a lot of trouble on the internet uh, after a tweet about the Google Photos app tagging black people as gorillas went viral. Uh, and this prompted a lot of discussion about who was designing and testing the software such that it would produce these results. Were there people of color on this team? You know, is this an example of a lack of diversity producing worse software because people were thinking too narrowly about what to build, what training data to use, and how to test it based on too narrow a range of experiences? And you know, here's a graphic from Google's latest diversity report from 2016. It's highlighting gender on the left and ethnicity on the right. And you can see that 1% of people at Google in technical roles identify as black in the US. And we, we talked about this at San Quentin. We talked about the leaky pipeline, starting with access in school. We talked about the outcomes, what research shows about how diversity impacts the output of teams. And this really got them thinking. And this really got them worried. Uh, because as we continued to discuss technology in the criminal justice system, uh, they were worried about a lack of representation for good reason, and that's what we're gonna talk about next. Um, but before we continue with the folks in San Quentin, something really positive happened in 26, sorry, 2017 that I, I wanna make sure we talk about, about representation. This happened recently. So the two most recent people to become Python core developers are women. Marietta and Carol Willing. According to the developer log, you can go look it up on GitHub, 
Uh, the first person to be added to this list was ESR in 2000. A lot has changed since then. Uh, the first woman to be added was Marietta earlier this year, 17 years later. Guido, the creator of Python, uh, actually issued a call to action to address the lack of diversity on the core dev team in his 2015 Python, PyCon keynote. He said, we needed at least two women devs by 2016. Uh, and he was right, because representation, seeing people who look like you doing something that you aspire to, matters. And boy, do you see the effects very quickly. It took a little longer than 2016, but you better believe that representation matters, because women and other people are absolutely watching this uh, and now seeing a path for themselves to contributing to Python or to open source software more generally. And there's a ton of science to back up that representation matters. So this is really great. This is a great thing for the Python community. But representation is really what this all came down to in that room, sitting in a circle at San Quentin, with a dozen inmates who are going to be there for the rest of their lives unless they get parole, uh, thinking about how technology is being used in the criminal justice system. So we talked about how algorithms are being used with predictive policing. That's predicting crimes and predicting who will be a criminal to distribute uh, you know, police uh, resources uh, in perhaps the optimal way. And we talked about algorithms being used to set bail. Like, are you able to get out of jail uh, because you can pay your bail or not? Uh, to determine what sentence you get and in making parole decisions. We don't have access to the source code for these algorithms. Uh, we don't know very much about the people designing the software that is making these decisions. There aren't laws yet about what's required. There's not really an audit trail. Uh, and we know today, statistically, um, that the people writing this software to do predictive parole, um, they're very unlikely to look like the people in the room with me, uh, who are mostly black and from poor neighborhoods and who are engaged with the criminal justice system that in the United States uh, we know from endless studies is systematically biased against them. And this question of who is designing the software, this question of representation, uh, it becomes a life or death question for these men. And this, this is why I care. So when I was asked uh, how I came to be in a room full of inmates at San Quentin, that's the long answer on why I care. When we talk about accessibility and access and diversity and representation, and when we work a little bit at a time together to increase awareness about these issues and we take actions to address them, we are little by little shifting this world into one where the software that we produce and the communities that we cultivate around the software better represent the people who are affected by it. And sometimes they're affected in very profound ways. And that's a profound thing to be a part of. I'm glad to be a part of this with you. But we can't sit idle. Um, so here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to tell you one thing in each of these categories that we've just spent time talking about. Uh, I'm going to tell you one thing in each of these categories that I'm going to do this year because I care. And then I want to ask everyone in this room to take one action with me before PyCon Israel 2018, before we get together next year. I want you to pick one of these buckets and take one step inside or outside the Python community before we reconvene next year. And I'll go first. I'll give you examples. So accessibility. As I mentioned earlier, there's been a lot, uh, there's been a lot going on in the United States recently. There's been a lot for me to protest. Uh, and I have friends with various disabilities who participate or would like to participate in these protests. And sometimes they can't uh, because the infrastructure of these protests isn't compatible with their disabilities. This includes, for example, people in wheelchairs on routes that aren't wheelchair accessible. And they share their experiences on social media, and I think it's important for me to signal boost that feedback and to actively ask about and push for accessibility in spaces where activism is happening. Because we all benefit from all of these people being able to participate. Access. I do not like that my sister went to a school where she could not take a programming class. This takes time to fix. It often takes legislation, at least in the United States. But while we're getting there, I'm going to give money 
to a local after school program that is teaching disenfranchised kids how to program. As I mentioned earlier, I want to help uh, PyCon North America make significant progress on speakership diversity for underrepresented groups, like black and Latino speakers. I think that's our next big call to action, and I'm excited to see what results I can share with you next year. And on the representation front, where it really all comes together, I'm actually very excited about this piece. This is the thing that I'm actually doing. Um, I'm going to be working with a podcast uh, and a, a journalism outfit called Life of the Law. And I'm going to work with these inmates that I met at San Quentin. And we're going to do some investigative reporting on this topic of algorithms in the criminal justice system to give a voice to the people who are affected and to dig in on how we can assess if these systems have bias. We know humans have bias, but we need to understand the bias in these systems too. And those are the four things that I'm gonna do. And I'm telling you so that I actually do them because now I feel accountable. And now it's your turn. So think about what we just talked about together. Think about what you are going to do in one of these four spaces. Look to your left. Look to your right. Before you leave for the next talk, share an idea with a neighbor, because when you say it out loud, it's gonna make you actually wanna do it. While you're at this conference, learn something new about accessibility, access, diversity, or representation. Because if everyone in this room does one thing, even one tiny thing, if you sum up all the 500 people who are here, that would be a huge impact on the Python community and in other communities that you care about. So I'm holding you to it. Pick one thing and do it. And that's it. That's my call to action to you based on a really personal story about something that I care about. And we covered many things. Are there any questions? Uh, if the, <clears throat> Let me rephrase the question. Uh, I think that uh, people can all work together to achieve the outcomes that we want, and that ultimately our obligation is to having a community that's reflective of the people that we're serving. And in the Python community, that's a very broad set. This is a big international, like the, the, the set of people who use Python to do things in the world is big, it is international, it encompasses a lot of different backgrounds, and really the obligation is to achieving that. I think who, who is doing that work uh, there's room for everybody. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. So uh, there are a couple of ways to, that I think we could break this down. So one is um, on experience level. So are there, are there technical talks that are appealing to the sort of beginner and intermediate and advanced programmers and Python programmers? You can also think about this by discipline. So there are folks who uh, maybe are software engineers using Python, and there are folks who are in the sciences, uh, in business, um, you know, scientific computing, are you know, are you hitting topics that cover a, a broad range of backgrounds and interests? Um, and there's also just like a lot of fun stuff that you can do with Python, a lot of fun things you can talk about about the communities that are doing this work um, that draw in that draw in people from a, a broad set of backgrounds. So those are a couple of ways to slice it. But if, if literally every talk is um, like. Dave, like a, like a super advanced Dave talk, just one after the other, like that's going to appeal to a very specific set of people. And it's, it's, my, it's easy, you know, everyone actually enjoys the conference more when you have a much broader set of talks to choose from. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Great, perfect. <laughs>